Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this fantastic celebration, I think, of what is showcases the best of ANU. My name's Margaret Harding, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Innovation, and I'll be your MC this evening. But um, to begin, I'd like to hand over to the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt, to do the welcome to country and make some opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Uh, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet this evening, pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging here on our campus. It's a great privilege to be able to use their land for such an inspirational event. So welcome attendees and finalists. And this is one of the, uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Vice Chancellor used to teach and know not to do that. Uh, anyway, uh, this is one of the most exciting events uh, from my perspective, uh, the second ANU Grand Challenge, uh, final pitch night. And it's exciting because I think it embodies what we want to be as the National University. We want to take the amazing breadth of talent here at ANU and let you figure out how you want to change the world and the university supporting those activities. And so this is a real chance uh, to let ideas flourish, which is right at the core of what we want to do. And my hope is that out of these things, big advancements will come. Uh, and these big advancements uh, are always going to be gone from the bottom up, not from the top down. And so that's why uh, we really are putting our stocks in you the ANU community to come up and self-organize on this. So the ANU Grand Challenges program, uh, which uh, Margaret Harding has been instrumental in uh, launching and creating, is really here um, to amplify and acknowledge some of the incredible work happening across campus. And uh, it is uh, uh, the second, of course. Uh, last year we had our first group, uh, and we've learned a bit, and we'll continue uh, to learn as we go. Uh, last year's winning team, Your Health in Your Hands, uh, has uh, gotten up and going, and I'm looking forward to amazing things coming out of them over the next uh, five years. So this year we had 14 Grand Challenge applications, and tonight you will see four of those battle it out for our 2018 title uh, with a quite a considerable paycheck at the end, uh, even by university standards, uh, and I'm very excited to myself see what the um, four teams have come up with. I have of course seen the initial pitch videos myself. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to Margaret who is uh, obviously emceeing, but this is I think acknowledged her last grand challenge event as she will be finishing up here in the next uh, uh, week or so. And I want to thank her publicly for all that she has done in this space and she hates to be acknowledged publicly. So I think we should just give her a little hand. And without further mar uh, ado, Margaret, I'll hand over to you and don't kick me on the way there. <laughs> so thank you. It is fabulous to be one of the, uh, the second last, actually, formal event I'll do as DVCR to actually host and uh, celebrate uh, this event here. I'm delighted to be here. This evening, as you know, we have four teams where the judges have had a very tough challenge to get this stage, to this stage, but to remind you, this scheme here is quite different from uh, what we used to do in the university. It is an investment scheme. And you as the audience this evening will get to participate, but we are looking for you know, large-scale ambitious programs that bring together the disciplines across this university that require long-term visionary thinking that will bring new thinking and innovation in methodological approaches to solve problems that really ANU is positioned to make a really national, international impact in here. We've got a phenomenal uh, celebration, as I said, but a showcase of research this evening with the four teams who are listed there this evening. The pitch night here is very simple, but there are a few rules that you need to be aware of. There's a huge stop clock over there, and it will be used. 15 minutes presentation, and the teams will be given a alert at 14 minutes. And then I will stand up, and if I begin agitating and moving closer to the team, it'll mean really you need to wrap up, and we will then open to the audience to have some questions and answers before rolling to the next team. 
So those are the rules. Next slide. Can I please publicly acknowledge and thank the judges for this final stage of the process and stage three. They are seated in the front row and very warmly thank the expertise both of our ANU experts but also of our alumni, partners and collaborators and thank them warmly for their ongoing contribution, expertise to the uh, process to date and they are sitting in the front row. One at least has said to me that they're open to bribes and whatever, <laughs> okay, okay. And I'll leave you to work out, you know, who that might be on here. But thank you to all of our uh, judges this evening. So if I could invite the first team who are presenting this evening, uh, Humanising Machine Intelligence, to come to the, uh, the front of the auditorium. All right, so uh, let the show begin. So my name's Seth Lazar. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to introduce our project on humanising machine intelligence to you. But I'm afraid I have to start with some bad news about human intelligence. And that is that we really suck at making decisions. We're really bad at it. This comes down to a lot of different sources. Um, one of them is that we're terrible at dealing with uncertainty. We're really bad at reasoning about, with and, and about probabilities. Um, we make bad statistical inferences all the time. One of them is base rate neglect. That's why there's a picture of a librarian up here. You heard the one about the librarian and the doctor? We're being kept to a clock, so I won't tell you the joke. <laughs> but it's not all about cognitive defects. It's also moral defects. We're biased in various ways. And often, you know, there's a lot of talk about implicit bias. Often we are consciously biased. We don't necessarily think it's wrong, but we are, in fact, um, acting out of bias. But often there is also unconscious bias. Someone just seems like a good bloke, someone you could get along with. Um, so you think, well, I'll hire that person. Usually that's going to be out of some reason that's, that's similar to you in some respect. And we systematically overestimate our abilities. This is something that I've been guilty of a few times. You are coming home after a long flight. You reckon you can do the drive, and you start out like this, and you're lucky if you don't end up like this. Um, so this is where machine intelligence comes in, right? And so when we say machine intelligence, we're referring to machine learning-driven data analytics on the one hand and autonomous systems on the other, the kind of things you find in self-driving vehicles, companion robots. And this holds out this wonderful promise of being able to improve on human decision-making. It could help us reason efficiently under uncertainty because you know, AI is basically applied probability theory. It could enable us to eliminate bias because why should a computer care about how you look or where you come from? And it could even drive us home when we're sleepy. But the reality is not all that great. There have been some fantastic stories about the use of AI in medical diagnostics, but if you've heard about stories recently in, in society, they have tended to be pretty bad ones. So Cambridge Analytica, for example, used machine learning to manipulate voters into incredibly consequential elections. Uh, we've got the use of facial recognition systems. This picture is from China, but it's also happening in Australia and in the UK, and it poses great threats to civil rights. Just a few days ago, on September 4th, California got rid of the cash bail system. Now, cash bail is a really regressive policy. It penalizes people who are worse off. The algorithms that they're going to be using to make risk assessments instead, there's a lot of worry about those entrenching further discrimination as well. And obviously, in Australia, we have had our own robo-debt fiasco. This is fairly low-level machine learning, but it was not low-level consequences, and again, for the most vulnerable. As far as autonomous systems go, the news is also not that great. So there's lethal autonomous weapons that have caused a great deal of concern. There was a decision in the European Parliament just the other day against them. Um, and then also we had our first fatal crash involving a self-driving vehicle at the start of the year. So how do we solve this problem? How do we realize the promise of machine intelligence to improve on human decision making without sort of falling into these pitfalls? Now, a big part of the story is definitely regulation and governance. And that clearly is something that needs to be looked at. And in fact, the 3A Institute at ANU is doing a great job of progressing on that. But we think it's not enough to only retrofit ethics to machine intelligence. We think it's also necessary to have machines make decisions that are morally right by design. So that's the idea behind the project, to humanize machine intelligence, to design ethical machine intelligence systems. There's our lovely logo. Um, and it's really important to be clear about what the stakes are here, because there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. Machine, machine intelligence systems are here, they're being used. The alternative to a world with ethical machine intelligence isn't a world without machine intelligence. 
It's a world with unethical machine intelligence, which could have potentially catastrophic consequences. So this is not just a grand challenge. This is a necessity. But what is the research that we need to do in order to realize this goal? Well, we sort of conceived of it, and this has been a project that's really, as the Vice Chancellor said, it's really bubbled up from the different disciplines all working together. It's something that we've, we've worked out in collaboration with one another. And we've got three phases, discovery, foundations, and design. The discovery phase is about identifying what the risks and opportunities are that are associated with the adoption of machine intelligence systems. This is something that you've got to have the social sciences for, so that's a big part of our project. The foundations phase is about asking whether machine morality is possible, what it would take to realize it. This is about looking at the fundamental nature of morality and rationality, and for that you've got to have philosophers. But our goal with this project is not just to understand the world, our goal is to change it. And for that we need to design ethical machine intelligence systems, and for that we need computer scientists, including Bob Williamson, who will take over now. Thank you, Seth. So we have three parts of our research agenda. The first is discovery. It's to work out what we should focus our uh, foundations and our design parts of our research on. One example is how can machine intelligence disrupt democracies? Seth's already indicated that that has happened. What is the specific question? Algorithms shape the way we see the world. They shape the way others see us. So understanding and controlling those algorithms better is central to the control of um, the democratic process. So the question is how can you uh, do that using refined machine intelligence systems. Like any new technology, machine intelligence will change social relationships. It's happened in the past, it will happen again. Uh, one example, so if you use machine intelligence to do automated decision making about who gets welfare benefits, for example, then that involves putting people into categories. Which categories? What are the consequences of such categorical choice? You can't just look at it from the perspective of the algorithm. You have to also look at it from the perspective of society, or more to the point, to the people that are being put into those boxes. We need to make such machine intelligence more sensitive to those concerns. Like other new technologies, the steam engine, for example, machine intelligence will change economies, from high finance to your household budget. How will it affect market interactions? Um, and how does machine intelligence impinge upon the nature of work? There's many ethical and fairness concerns to be dealt with there. These are all in the realm of our discovery theme. Within foundations, the problem's big and it's gnarly. It's illustrated here, right? How do we implement machine morality given the uncertainty, complexity, and disagreement that you always find in moral problems? They're a big tangled mess and they look different depending upon where you stand. We're not pretending that's going to go away. We have to grapple with that complexity and we have to be able to embed it into the machine intelligence systems. And the way you have to do that is machine intelligence systems work on mathematics. That's the way they're built. Therefore, you need to turn this moral mess into equations. That's part of our research agenda. Specifically, we're looking at uh, technically what it's called is a sequential moral decision theory not just making decisions once, but making them in sequence. Existing machine intelligence systems do this already, but without ethics, without morality. That's something that we have to do. Philosophy has to catch up. And then finally, we have to think about opening the black box, right? Rather than thinking of machine intelligence as this inscrutable algorithm that somehow affects our lives, we need to understand what it's doing. In order to be able to do that, you need to be able to have the machine intelligence systems make their values explicit. How can you represent the ethical choices that a machine intelligence system is making? And finally, as Seth says, we wish to change the world. And that means going through to the design stage. And so we will do this with our partners, who you'll hear about shortly. It's a fast moving area, and so we don't want to lock ourselves down immediately to particular um, case studies, but in two broad areas that we'll be looking at uh, in the area of autonomous systems, get for, think of um, all of the problems arriving with self-driving vehicles, and in particular, think of the complicated interface between what the machine intelligence system does and what the human does, and then put an overlay of ethics on that. It's a complicated problem. We need research to solve it. And then in machine learning decision support, algorithms making decisions about people, 
we need to uh, build algorithms for risk assessment, risk assessment with an explicit representation of the, the values and the morality. And it's not just about fairer outcomes, it's about building systems that have a process that you can uh, trust and believe in. So to tell you who is going to do that, let me pass over to my colleague Tony. Thank you, Bob, and hello, everyone. So who are we? We're scholars from across ANU, and we've been handpicked by Seth, our project leader. We each bring disciplinary expertise necessary to address the problem of how to design machine intelligence so it actually represents our best selves. And each member of the team has a standout track record. We have three ANU Future Fellows. We have philosophers who regularly publish in the world's most prestigious journals. And we have computer scientists who are winning awards for their collaboration with industry, as well as for their fundamental research. Crucially, we have leadership with strength and depth. We've managed projects and indeed departments that have multi-million dollar budgets. So the individual researchers are great. That doesn't sound very modest, does it? I'm sorry. But I think that it is, we do have wonderful individual researchers. But importantly, we're more than the sum of our parts. It's easy to draw nice pictures with neat arrows that go between disciplines. But here, it really does mean something. Yes, we come from very different parts of the campus. But because we share a commitment to humanizing machine intelligence, and because we share a second language, or indeed for many on the team, a third language, and that language is decision theory, we've been able to construct a project together that no one of us, and certainly no one single discipline, discipline group, could be able to carry out alone. Each stage of the research, discovery, foundation, design, requires input from all three disciplines and will benefit from the expertise of all of the team members. So this is fundamentally and necessarily a collaborative project, and we're the team that can do it. Now on partnerships, as Bob mentioned, now humanizing machine intelligence is a global grand challenge. And we've already identified and made plans to collaborate with partners around the world. And I'll say something about a few of those. Within academia, our nearest and dearest partner will, of course, be our own 3A Institute. And members of our group have had conversations with the superb leader of 3A here, Professor Genevieve Bell, about how our project can actually complement uh, the important work that's being, di being done there. And we're very grateful to have Genevieve Bell on our advisory board. We'll also work closely with the Cambridge Center for the Future of Intelligence. And anticipation of that collaborative work, I signed a memorandum of understanding with the Cambridge Center for the Future of Intelligence about two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago, on behalf of the ANU. And we've had very positive exchanges with institutes at New York University, at Harvard, at MIT, at Johns Hopkins University, among other places. Within civil society, we've been talking with the Templeton World Charity Foundation about a call for applications that we think is perfect for our project. And one of our team members has just been awarded a large grant from the Future of Life Institute. Within Enterprise, I've been working on a project about building trust in machine intelligence that's been funded by Google, alongside the head of content and AI for Google Asia Pacific. One of Google DeepMind's co-founders, now its chief scientist, was supervised for his PhD by a member of our team. And he, single, he signaled DeepMind's interest in how our project develops. And we have strong links with Element AI, which is Canada's version of DeepMind. In government, we've already had interest from DFAT. And Data61 will, of course, also be a close partner as we move forward. But an important question remains. What do you actually get if you back us? What will our big outcomes be? At its heart, this project is about creating the basic research that will shape the next generation of machine intelligence systems. Over the seven years of the project, we will generate exciting new knowledge in our core discipline areas 
the new knowledge without which humanizing machine intelligence would simply be impossible. We'll design deployment-ready ethical machine intelligence algorithms and a methodology for developing others for new use cases. And last but not least, we'll build a self-sustaining HMI center, which will provide much needed regional and international leadership. And now I'll pass over to Seth to wrap okay, up. I have a last word. And now that we've seen that there's a hard time li limit, I'll be quick. Um, so while we've been designing this project, I've had this mantra in my mind, do what only you can do. I've been thinking about what it is that the ANU really is the, the, the place to go for where government, where industry look for leadership from us. And we think that has to do with the basic research that we do, the fundamental new knowledge that we create. And so then, where's the question, where's the problem where you really need this new knowledge, where you have to have a long-term vision, right, where you have to do this kind of fundamental research? Humanizing machine intelligence is exactly that problem. So what's the team that you need? Well, you need a team with empirical expertise, theoretical expertise, applied expertise. That's what we've got. The engine is running, the wheels are spinning. Margaret, we are ready to go. <laughs> So thank you for a fabulous start and scene setting for the evening. We have two roving mics and we have about eight minutes now to actually have Q&A from the audience. And so please could you raise your hand, uh, just tell us who you are and where you're from and please um, um, ask the, the team questions. I'm Mike Smithson uh, in psychology. So naturally my question is going to be, well, where is psychology in this? And in particular, where is the expertise for cognitive computational modeling, which would seem to be essential for generating the kinds of uh, algorithms, translations of ethical systems into equations and the like that you would need in order to actually make this happen? Reach out just forward with your left hand. With your left hand, it's that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Colin is a, um, a philosopher of psychology. His last few publications have been in psychology journals. He's fantastic on the computational theory of mind. Um, he's published work on modeling um, bee consciousness using neural, neural networks. Um, he's our go-to guy for that kind of thing. Um, and he's absolutely on top of it. Of course, as we build the project up, we're going to look to expand in various ways, hiring ECRs and areas where we need to expand. But yeah, Colin's our go-to guy for that. Hi, my question is for Seth. Um, I'm Hamad. I'm, I'm, I'm a physicist. Um, given your opening statement that uh, we humans, we are bad at making good decisions and we are corrupt morally in so many ways, why would you want to humanize machine <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, this is a good point, this is a good point. The point is though, um, the thing that Tony said about our best selves, right? You want to capture our best selves and obviously this is, these are the ways in which we fall short. But of course, we also aspire to be so much better in all of these respects. And all of the moral ideals that you would want to input into these systems, are they're ultimately human as well. So our flaws as well as our successes are both part of us. We want to capture the successes in the humanizing side, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah, my name is Jochen Trumpf. I'm from engineering. Um, so I was missing a statement about data in all of this. So algorithms are limited by the data that, can, that they can operate on. And... Um, other than being bad at making decisions, humans are also not very good at sharing data, or at least sharing useful data. And so um, the question I would have, um, I would imagine there'd be situations where the best solution is actually to not allow a machine intelligence algorithm at all. So for example, because there are fundamental restrictions in terms of the data that you can get. So do you have any comments on that? Mm -hmm. I think actually you'd be good to do that. Yep, um, sure. So, of course, machine intelligence does rely upon data, and of course, you don't want to always use a machine to do everything. We did not assert that, and we don't believe that. Um, some of the questions that we'll be looking at will be actually drilling directly into what your question is about. What are the characteristics? When is it sensible to use a machine to make certain decisions? Can you characterize how well they can make the decisions? What is it about the sources of data that affect those decisions? When you bring the ethics into it, it gets a lot more gnarly because you have the phenomenon that 
if you want to train a machine based on data, which is effectively the historical record, then you might not be happy about the moral stance that was taken making the decisions which that data records. Nevertheless, there is value in attempting to do that. So we've got to try and unpick all of those uh, questions as part of our research program. Thank you. Up the back. Oh, quick one. Uh, Ron Pace, Chemistry. So this project will be designed and run by intellectuals, academics, you know, <clears throat> full disclosure, I think I'm one of those. And <clears throat> what we have learnt from, I think, from, from historical experience is that when experts, intellectuals, seek to design optimal models for organisation of society, morality and things like that, it leads to catastrophic tyranny. <laughs> so how do you avoid that temptation, even with the best will in the world? Uh, it's, it's a great question. I think it's a, um, a really big concern on the sort of the regulation and the governance side of AI, how these systems are going to be used. Our focus is on a, design, a set of design problems, and like Bob said, when we go into the discovery phase, we're identifying the design problems where we can make, where we can make progress. That's going to definitely mean that there are some areas where you don't want to be going into, and that's absolutely fine. Nonetheless, there are still going to be these systems. They're definitely going to be around. They're already here. So you have a choice between whether you have ones that are more ethical or less ethical. Tony, you talked a little bit about uh, the working with some of the big companies in this, and that is one way, of course, to bring some reality to the rather abstract things that we tend to do at the university. But I've, the, the relationships as described sounded a little ethereal. Maybe you could give us a sense of the uh, reality of how we might work with them in detail and share information data, their platforms, et cetera. Sure. Can I come to the mic? I'll be here so you can hear me. I actually think that there's an answer to that that responds to the previous um, person who asked a question as well, that it's not just going to be academics who are working on this, that it's important at every stage in the process, and I think we went through the three stages, the discovery, the foundation, the design, we're going to be working for partners, so with partners. So I'll be leading the discovery phase. Um, I'll be working with partners from industry as well as from government, for example, and other academic bodies. There we're actually identifying what are the risks and opportunities of using machine intelligence. So we need to start with that in the discovery stage. And there we'll be working with partners in industry to see what are the problems that they actually want to solve. Um, what are, in civil society, what do people see to be the dangers? What are the perceived risks? And we'll bring that actually in from the discovery stage and move on to the foundation stage. So these partners are going to be working with us at every one of these three stages. Any final questions? If not, please join with me in thanking a fantastic first presentation. Uh, we'll just take a short moment while we uh, hand over and mic up the next team. For those of you who've arrived late, on the left-hand side of the room there are plenty of seats on the other side of the auditorium if you'd like to make your way over. Okay, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage the second team to present this evening on restoring climate with enhanced earth systems. Thanks very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all for uh, making such a celebration to celebrate my birthday. That's really nice of you. Thank you very much. And uh, now let's get serious. This drought has really hit our family hard. Climate change is making the droughts more severe. So, what we see here illustrate is climate change is posing a major risk, as we all know, to agriculture and food security. And current industrial agriculture actually also releases emissions on a scale that helps to intensify climate change. The outcome of this is a vicious circle of intensifying droughts and other climate extremes, and you know, droughts and flooding especially. So importantly, this cycle can be broken, and we can break it through regenerative agricultural practices. So the next slide shows you how something like this can work. There's 10 years in between these two slides, and this is on the Lust Plateau in China, 
which is near Mongolia. It's about one third of the size of Mongolia. And there's two and a half million people in this area that were scraping by on a subsistence level um, on soils that were entirely degraded by uh, millennia of uh, unsustainable uh, grazing and, and use. And the soils were washing away into the Yellow River, which actually gets its name from that. Um, then they started a project. They started to improve the land. They started to terrace the land with, uh, with uh, the hands of millions of people. And they planted trees and crops. And these trees and crops, they covered 5% of the area of the Lus Plateau. And the land there started to improve very rapidly. And the trees helped, and the terracing helped to retain water. And the uh, water retention then helped to uh, grow good crops. And we should say that what you see on the left is entirely due to what humans have done. This used to be a very fertile environment before the degradation started. So 10 years later then, these two and a half million people are well fed and they have actually got a tenancy of the land, which is one of the carrots for them to get into this scheme. And they are even growing high value crops that they are selling. So in this way, regenerative approaches help with water retention, productivity increase, and resilience of the land or the agriculture to droughts and flooding. <laughs> but more importantly, when applied scientifically, they can also draw down on a permanent basis very large quantities of carbon from the atmosphere. And that attacks the root cause of climate change. So this is critical because zero emissions is nice, but it's just not enough. We need to go there as soon as possible, no question. But in addition to zero emissions to avoid dangerous climate conditions, we must draw down about 200 billion tons of carbon from the atmosphere. This is so much that it requires us to enhance the operation of earth systems, natural earth systems, and regenerative agricultural practices are an essential component in this. So how does regreening a landscape draw down carbon? Well, I'm showing here a tree, but it is actually a metaphor for the entire global carbon cycle. And in that uh, tree, we can see here, or in the carbon cycle, we see enormous fluxes of carbon in, going in and coming out. And these fluxes are almost balanced, but they are also 10 times larger than our uh, emissions per year. So these fluxes per year, if we can start to play with those by uh, locking in more drawdown and re, uh, constraining the release, then we can start to make a net influence. That net influence typically goes into the soil. And that's typically what you see in these regenerative practices. Now, Australia has got about 100 million hectares available and suitable for this sort of application. And most of it currently has limited productivity and very impoverished soils for carbon and nutrients. And all of this agricultural land is colored here, and the intensity of the color is in indicating harsher conditions. Now, our projects will seize the opportunity that we see illustrated here to improve practices on a major component of this land. We will never cover everything, because there will always be people that don't want to join. But it will be in a close partnership with the Australian farming and forest management community. We estimate that Australia alone, if we go that way and re-green Australia, then we can capture up to 10% of the global requirement of carbon capture. So it's a big game. But for doing this, we must develop precision infrastructure and management tools. And for that, I hand over to Justin. Thanks very much, Elko. So what you saw on the Loess Plateau was brute force. That was um, people taking their lives into their own hands. What we'd like to do in Australia is apply a scientific approach at large scale, and that requires us to focus on a single pixel. And each of those single pixels has uh, a step one, which is land improvement and reversing the degradation. 
The terracing may not be as extensive as you saw on the lowest plateau. We don't have those mountains, but we do have uh, soils that need to be broken and ripped apart so that water can infiltrate. Um, the other thing is to capture the water and uh, recreate catchments with dams so that uh, we have the water held into the, into the landscape. Then renewable energy with pump hydro and irrigation can put nutrients into the trees and grasses and to get them through that establishment phase. So with this land improvement, we can then move on to the management stage. And management interlocks four essential ingredients in a multi-layered approach. So we need to integrate cropping, pasture, and trees into uh, an agroecosystem for capture, carbon capture, uh, and agronomic output. We'll work on the below ground, the microbial system, to fix nitrogen and gather phosphate. And this will increase the drawdown into the land. Now, to store that permanently, we need to char the biomass that will grow on our farms and, and put that into the soil, which improves nutrient and water holding capacity. And the fourth key ingredient is a new um, target for our mining industry. That is rock dust mineral fertilization. This is bulk. Uh, slow release fertilizer that can add nutrients to accelerate uh, this system. So what does it look like in practice? This is digital agriculture at scale. We've developed uh, experimental systems over the past four years in partnership with the Fenner School and the National Arboretum. This is a GigaVision camera that allows us to see all the trees uh, and the forest blocks develop uh, in response to seasonal changes. We also fly drones uh, over the system so we can look at size, shape, and color and plant response to the climate and to uh, the unique soil types. These data-rich layers with ANU Tech Launcher students have developed visualization systems so that we can see this high uh, dimensional data uh, in, in real time and virtually. So we can look at uh, the response of the trees and the climate. There's going to be soil temperature uh, and layer information. And the next stage of this project is to generate these um, models on each of those pixels that, that Elko showed you across the uh, 100 million hectares of cropping, pasture, uh, and forest systems. We'll also be partnering with Biocarbon Engineering, a new disruptive drone company that will take these plans and fly their drones to drop the right seeds in the right environments. And we have precision genetic technologies to identify what is the right seed for the right environment. So as we take this uh, to the farmers, we'll be able to develop models. The second phase for the Tech Launcher students is to develop models that are personalized for farmers. And I now hand over to Aurora. Thanks. All right. So a big question is, how are we going to facilitate Im uh, implementation of these enhanced Earth systems on a scale that can actually make some sort of global impact? And one of the answers to that is through modeling. And we have three types of modeling. There's the biophysical, social, and economic. So for example, um, the experimental modeling, uh, Justin just showed you an example of that. So there would be a video or a visualization, and we can make that precise to each farmer's piece of land. And then we can tell someone, here's what your land will look like. Here's how this will affect your pocketbook. So we'll use these three types of modeling in an integrated way in order to inform farmers, um, investors, and policymakers. But more than that, we can also use modeling in order to support people follow on. So when farmers take up these, this regenerative practice, um, we can use, use modeling to tell them, this is what you should do next year and into the future. So they feel supported in the process. Another key to facilitating um, adoption is to demonstrate to the community that economic benefits and environmental benefits are not at odds with each other but they are actually mutually reinforcing. And that's not something that is always intuitive. So we see here four different types of agricultural practices in Australia. 
And you see that the regenerative agriculture is in that top corner. And so we see profits on the top, um, cost intensive practices on the bottom, um, carbon emitting practices on the left, and carbon drawdown practices on the right. And the yellow arrow demonstrates that really all three of those quadrants have motivations for moving towards regenerative agriculture. Because remember, when we improve the soil, we get better growth. And growth means profits, and it also means drawdown. Another thing to remember with this modeling is that when we improve the soil, it also improves resilience. So even that top quadrant that's making profit but is emitting carbon, they have the, they have the motivation to adopt um, regenerative practices as well. Another benefit of taking this sort of approach is that the dominant driver of change here is really from the bottom up. And we don't have to wait for a top-down initiative. So as you saw in that very first video from the farmer talking about the drought, farmers understand that extreme weather conditions are caused by climate change. And those farmers want to be able to do something, just like everyone. We all want to be able to do something personally and individually. And so what we're providing then is a pathway. Here's what you can do. Here's how it'll change your land. Here's how it'll change your econo economics of your farm. And furthermore, you're actually going to be doing something that's going to have long-lasting effects and improving climate security. And that sort of message offers empowerment and also reassurance that gives the bottom-up approach real power. And I'll now hand back to Elko to close. Right, thank you very much, Aurora. Um, so just to summarize, uh, then I've got the entire project pathway here. So essentially, we start off with a project where it uses a lot of what's currently being considered as waste. We're looking at mining waste, we're looking at farm waste, and we're looking at wasted land. And it then optimizes the use of those resources in a scientific manner and rolls out the application in partnership with the landholders and business. It creates increased farm productivity and resilience to climate extremes, and eventually it reduces operational costs because it starts to pay for itself. It becomes a self-sustaining cycle. And the final outcomes that we get from this are increased food security, improved biodiversity and conservation, improved water retention and availability, and carbon drawdown that helps to attack actually, you know, those are all the, the symptoms of climate change that we are tackling, but carbon drawdown actually attacks the root cause of that climate problem. Now, in the next slide, we have the uh, composition of our project. We have three spheres of principal activity which are very strongly interlinked and all the time interacting. Um, the st various staff members are listed around there. And we have our uh, uh, agreed partners listed around here. And I must, to my shame, admit that I've forgotten to put the CSIRO there and UTAS. So, I hope there's nobody from there here. <laughs> Um, but they should be on there as well. And then at the bottom, we have the advisory board where <coughs> Professors Hansen and Beerling are uh, international heavyweights in the science academic sector. And Damien Dwyer and Helen Degeling are heavyweights in the resource sector. And then, then we have Michael Pill. He is a director in Commonwealth Bank and is actually here in the audience with us. We're very happy to have you. Thank you. So uh, thank you again. I'm sure you'll agree, another cracking presentation. You are going to make the judges work hard. But over to the audience, please. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a farmer from Yass. Um, I'm wondering about goats and stocking. Yeah. So go goats and stocking. So there's, there's a problem with goats is that they will eat everything. The problem is that we have, uh, uh, we have to have some time to get the growth larger than the grazers. 
and before we can actually let the grazers go and eat it all up. Uh, but once it is established, there actually is a role for managed pasturing. So if you work with larger herds, and the larger herds can be managed and pasturing together, and we will get the sort of, you know, the soil trampling, the urination, the defecation on the soil, which brings nutrients into the soil. It's basically moving around in a controlled manner, larger herds, rather than dispersing uh, occasional animals, you know, two per hectare or something like that. And that actually works an awful lot better. It's been proven to work, for example, even in places like South Africa, Ethiopia, and so on, that these in very arid environments help to bring vegetation back and to keep and maintain good grazing land without actually having to burn it. And so it's definitely something that fits into a picture like this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Douglas Robertson, Director of Research Services. Um, so how are you going to work with individual farmers um, throughout the program? Because this looks like a project that's crying out for co-production methodologies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, some people in the audience might be familiar with the um, diffusion of innovation or social adoption curve, um, which would tell us that there are going to be innovators who want to start doing this right away. Um, and then there will be early adopters who maybe we can influence through that group of innovators. So we network out through that group. And then there'll be a, a, a more difficult group um, of, of the early majority. And so a few principles, I guess, that work in our favor there are that um, we see that people want to adopt things when they can see the effects. Um, and that, that is definitely the case here. And they also want to adopt an innovation when it's something that is close to who they are. And I think that both of those are the case for farmers. Um, so we'll be using that modeling, taking those to, um, to farm shows. Um, and another idea we have is making sure that we work with farmers in an area so that a single farmer doesn't feel like an outcast for taking up the adoption, but that we're talking to people whose land all borders each other so they can make the decision together because we we hear that there's sometimes um, a concern that if I adopt this, it might be causing harm to you, and so I don't want to do anything different because I don't want to be um, seen as this social pariah. So I don't know if that answers a bit what you were, what you were asking. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Baker from CSR across the road. I'm a retired fellow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not, not what you, the question's not what you might expect. Um, it's more to do with, the Australian farmers are grouped under many, many industries and they're all represented by RDCs, Research Development Corporation. So there's wool, there's cotton, there's grains, there's meat and, and so on. But there's no mention of those in your presentation. How are you going to bring them into it and also find your way for making recommendations that fit with all the recommendations that the farmers are uh, receiving from all those other bodies? I can uh, try to answer that one. So we currently work and are funded by the Grains Research Development Council. Uh, and they've uh, helped us set up on the ANU campus a, a, a phenomics climate facility where we can use the same uh, technologies that I showed uh, outdoors, indoors, to try to manipulate and advance new varieties. So we have an in with the GRDC. They also already operate these Millennium uh, national variety trials and we've been talking with them about how to install the infrastructure to get the, the digital farm up off the ground. Um, the, the other agency that coordinates with the RDCs is the NCRIS plant phenomics facility that I used to, to be part of. Uh, and so we've started these conversations to roll out the precision agriculture and our contribution is to not neglect the below ground contribution to really make it regenerative precision agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a long conversation with the RDCs that, that they're all, everyone's kind of hovering around at the table now trying to integrate the new technology. Um, and we're hoping to make it kind of a complete models that actually can include climate models. There was five of these. Yep. Um, Jenny from uh, Research Office, Joint Ecologies of Science. I have a question for you about the plant side, because we're talking about, you know, grow things to change, you know, positively impact the environment. 
But at the moment, everything's changed towards a bad situation. So will you cover any research in terms of developing new plants that are more resilient to the environment change? So as far as precision breeding, is that what you're asking? Absolutely. That, that's kind of the mainstream science that, that's already being done. Um, we've got climate-ready crops um, for annual cropping systems, but the little uh, attention has been paid for trees. That's part of the current research. Little attention has been paid to perennial crops. But there's enormous native biodiversity in this country, uh, both in eucalyptus and acacia. We're partnering with CSIRO's Tree Seed Center across the way, and we're using genomic selection to pre-select the best varieties for the best environments. That's all, all part of this that I didn't show. Thanks for asking. One final question. Um, Jochen Trumpf again from Engineering. Um, I have thought whether I can ask this politely, but by Germanic nature is getting in the way, so I'll just ask it bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a Okay. Um, so you've partly answered this in the answer to the last question, but I kept sitting here and thinking, are these guys in the right scheme? Because it sounded a lot like you actually have the answer. So my question is, what is the fundamental unsolved research challenge in this? Because I didn't get that from your presentation. Okay, so the fundamental research question is here is how do we optimize the system? The system at the moment is being implemented in an ad hoc basis in a lot of places. Yes, that's true. And what we are seeing is that some people are beginning to, to uh, combine certain measures, but, uh, but it's never in a scientific monitored way. And it's very dangerous because in terms, if you also want to uh, you know, not just do the cropping, the food production, you can easily do that and push away the climate influence. And you could really make some damage on the climate influence if you start making wetlands, for example, because then suddenly you start pulling away one unit of CO2, and you start releasing one of methane, which gives you a one in 30 worse condition for climate change. So what you really want to do is optimize the system, and you go through these various layers and these, uh, the precision monitoring for each soil condition, for each climate condition that is available, and you keep on monitoring to actually adjust to the anomalies that are coming your way in terms of climate anomalies. And then you can start to work, make sure that you hit the balance where you optimize the production and you optimize your carbon drawdown without actually starting to uh, make, you know, do damage where you start feeding methane back into the atmosphere. It's basically mm -hmm. an integration uh, and with precision so that we can scale it instead of having every farmer have to discover it on their own. Mm -hmm. um, our time is up, but please join me for, to thank the team for their presentation. All right, now for something completely different. Our third presentation this evening is on social cohesion, inclusion and diversity. Good evening, my name is Kate Reynolds and I'm the team leader of this grand challenge on strengthening social cohesion for the prosperity of all Australians. Our task tonight as a leadership team, myself, Michael Zakulin and Babita Bart, is to make our case. Our position is clear. Social cohesion is vital for the economy, quality of life and democracy. We, we need to find new ways to strengthen it because it is under threat. Our grand challenge maps a pathway forward and in this presentation we are going to outline our position in more detail. Michael Zakulin is going to talk about social cohesion and why it's a grand challenge, what is the nature and extent of the problem. Babita will take stock of why uh, current, what are current efforts uh, and how, uh, what are the issues with those? And then I'm going to spend more time describing our research project in detail. And then in closing, we're going to talk more about why ANU and why this team. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Kate. Uh, you know, don't we agree that we all want to live in a community that's healthy, wealthy, happy, and wise? Well, social cohesion is the key to such prosperity. Social cohesion is vital to a society. It increases trust. It creates a sense of belonging. 
it increases engagement and participation within the larger community. It is about living together harmoniously with all of our differences. A large body of data shows that controlling for certain factors, strengthening social cohesion, decreases crime rates, discrimination and polarization, and improves mental health, community action, and resilience. This is an important takeaway. There are tangible benefits which come from strong social cohesion. There are also serious consequences when it is neglected or it weakens. When it goes down, bad things can happen. Global events and data show us that social cohesion is weakening. Think about Brexit. Think about political polarization and the subsequent paralysis of political institutions in policymaking. Think about the rise in xenophobia, in nationalism, increased tensions amongst groups within societies and electorates. Yes, there are complex phenomena that underpin many of these trends, but the bottom line is that beneath them all lie questions related to national identity, discrimination, fragmentation, and a lack of unity, all of which are related to social cohesion. If we look at the different data sources that are available across time, we can observe downward shifts. The World Values Survey shows that there are fears about immigrants and foreign workers, and these are increasing over time in different places around the world, including in Australia. The same patterns show as well applied to religion. If we look more closely at Australia, we see the Scanlon Mapping Social Cohesion Survey, and this demonstrates a downward trend in social cohesion between 2007 and 2017. Finally, if we look at a survey from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, two indicators of social cohesion, trust and participation, show a concerning pattern. There are indications of increased distrust of other people across time and a lack of involvement in groups, which relates to participation. These trends are compounded by the fact that Australia is growing faster and more diverse than most other countries. We are growing at a rate faster than the majority of other countries in the OECD. Considering all these indicators, we see a storm brewing close to our shores. There are serious cracks emerging in our social fabric, and the data is showing that social cohesion in Australia is at risk. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a crossroads, and the path we choose today affects Australia's future. This is not meant to be alarmist. This is not an exaggeration. We can remain on the path that we are currently on, low investment in social relations, and assume that social cohesion will occur naturally over time, recognizing the potential pitfalls that are on this path, including heightened marginalization, discrimination, and risks of violent extremism. Alternatively, we can choose a second path. We can learn from other countries and do so with urgency to advance Australia. We can pursue a new path, one which actively looks to new ways to strengthen social cohesion and involve all Australians in the process. Just as political leaders talk about the need for physical infrastructure when it comes to population growth, we argue you also need to invest in social infrastructure. Diversity is real. Cohesion is a choice. I'm going to turn you over to Babita, who will talk to you about the current state of social cohesion efforts. Thank you, Michael. Many of you in the audience will recognize that we need to invest in the social fabric of our community. We need to strengthen social cohesion. Policymakers, business leaders, and community organizations we have interviewed also agree. There are four exciting uh, developments that are happening. First, at the policy level, this year, the government has announced new funding for social integration through a community grant program. 
there is a recognition that we need to do more. Businesses guided by corporate social responsibility are investing in the communities to create long-term social impact. Third, as finance, investors are willing to accept lower rate of return on investment if it results in social benefit. These priorities are leading to new fund to new, uh, for projects related to social impact. For example, earlier this year, ANZ uh, raised 1.2 billion for social investment bonds related to United Nations development goals. Fourth, at the community level, we, new innovative business models such as social enterprises are emerging. These organizations combine business model with a social mission. Increasingly, government and businesses are interested in social procurement, purchasing goods and services from social enterprises that bring benefit to the wider community. These are innovation, but money from these program is not flowing to social cohesion because there are many barriers. Now, what are these barriers? So there is a lack, uh, lack of tool to measure social cohesion. We have clear economic indicators to evaluate programs, but we need comprehensive, robust, and holistic measurement for social cohesion. There is a lack of high quality research to work out how to prevent social cohesion decline or how to strengthen it. There has been too much emphasis on getting something done quickly rather than being research driven. Research efforts are small scale, sporadic, and weak. To attract investment and resources for social cohesion, we need strong evidence that a program is effective and has an ongoing benefit. Efforts need to be scalable, which requires long-term financial support. These are new financial instruments that can be leveraged to strengthen social cohesion, but these need to be carefully structured based on trial and field evidence. Summarizing these point, these are there are exciting things that are happening. There are innovative shift in policy space, but what we need is new uh, measurement tools to reliably assess social cohesion. We need a research-led approach, and we need new financial mechanism to sustain and scale social cohesion efforts. Um, and our research program that Kate is going to outline addresses all these issues. Kate. This team has developed an integrated research enterprise for social cohesion knowledge, understanding and education, RESCUE. RESCUE incorporates five programs of activity, the five S's, synthesis, stock take, solve, scale up and share. Importantly, RESCUE is interdisciplinary. It breaks down barriers between disciplines and harnesses the breadth of expertise, methods, and approaches to find new solutions. Due to time constraints, we are unable to talk about all aspects of this research, but we do want to highlight the most high-risk innovative elements that get our team excited. We are excited about synthesis. It involves members of our team developing new interdis interdisciplinary measurement tools that assess social cohesion. With these tools, we'll be able to assess community vulnerabilities and capabilities. Imagine if we could click on a map like this one and get up-to-date information about social cohesion. Such information is vital to government and community groups to inform planning, allocate resources and assess progress. We're also excited about SOLVE. We will discover new interdisciplinary solutions to strengthen social cohesion that are effective, efficient and robust. We will use ABS and Scanlon data to identify Australian communities that are high and low in diversity. We'll have a sample of 90 communities which will be divided into clusters of 30. Communities will be randomly assigned to intervention and control groups using randomised control methods, or RCTs. With a focus on participatory methods, we will visit communities and map existing efforts with respect to strengthening social cohesion. There may be social enterprises at work, community groups with integration grants, local government programs, drop-in community hubs, and anti-racism programs in schools and workplaces. We want to know which of these have been effective and why. Integrating this bottom-up knowledge with top-down expertise, we will co-design and implement new interventions 
that enhance or supercharge community efforts. Given current gaps in the research and our team's expertise, initial interventions will have three foci. The first will be on social business enterprises and entrepreneurial skills. The second, marginalised youth from minority groups, specifically Indigenous and Muslim youth. The third, majority group mindsets regarding diversity and multiculturalism, groups that are often an afterthought in these kind of discussions. We will assess social cohesion before we do anything in these communities, after we've conducted these interventions and at six month follow up. We'll run three randomised control trials or RCTs, each 18 months long, one after the other, learning and adapting better methods and processes as we go. For those communities that don't fit this model, we'll have community specific solutions using other methods such as large scale uh, comparative studies and ethnography. Imagine if we could have transferable, scalable, robust information on the factors that are core to strengthening social cohesion. Once we know what works, we're excited about Scale Up, which is focused on a trial of social cohesion investment bonds to raise money to support social cohesion interventions. This is a high risk and high benefit endeavour. Imagine what is possible with new funding from bonds to support more social cohesion enhancement activities. For some of you here, it might be useful to have a medical analogy of this research program. If we think of lack of social cohesion as a disease, rescue through synthesis uh, is focused on working out how to diagnose the problem. Who has the disease and where are they located? Who needs urgent treatment and where will prevention be most effective? Rescue is also is focused on developing and testing our drug, our treatments uh, for this disease through trial and research in Solve. Scale up is akin to a commercialisation phase where new funding is established to distribute our treatments. As a team, we are excited that Rescue addresses obstacle to progress and offers a comprehensive program of research that means we can advance quickly. We have hope that these efforts will temper the coming storm and will make a difference. Before our time is up, we also want to spend some time talking about why ANU, why this team. So I'll hand over to you, Michael. Great. Well, thanks, Kate. Well, I can tell you that the ANU, in its 2017 annual report, says the following. To be enduring significance in the post-war life of the nation to support the development of national unity and identity, to improve Australia's understanding of itself and its neighbours, and to contribute to economic development and social cohesion. Social cohesion, simply, National identity, unity, and social cohesion is the mission statement of the Australian National University. We are very, very excited. Pardon me. Uh, we are very excited because we have a team of 20 members across five colleges and 12 disciplines. They have the experience, the expertise, and the commitment to pursuing this grand challenge research and bringing it to a successful conclusion. We also plan to be joined by 20 postdoctoral fellows and 20 PhDs, in essence, training the next generation of social cohesion researchers. We also have the networks and the linkages to become the national and international leader in this area. Our team has existing and extensive uh, networks and linkages with hard to reach communities. These networks ensure that we are project ready. In closing, our project aligns with the ANU's mission. It's, it is controversial and its benefits, if successful, will be shared by all rather than captured by some. It trains future generations of researchers and quite simply, it is unlikely at the outset to be systematically funded at the necessary scale by private capital, national research bodies or government agencies. It meets each of the criteria of the Grand Challenges Scheme 
and we hope you all agree that ANU should invest in rescue. Thank you. Thank you. There's a hand up already at the back. Again, please just uh, introduce yourself or tell us where you're from and ask your question. Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Sonia. I'm from Business School. And my question is how you will select the community for your research project. Thank you. So we will be using a combination of data sources to identify communities that are, have either high or low diversity, and we'll be using those to select the communities for this project. So it's going to be a data-driven selection process and where um, on other areas where these kind of programs have been run, uh, they, the data selection, which communities are selected and using data-based approaches is quite critical uh, to being able to get good evidence about what's working and why. Douglas Robertson, Director of Research Services. Similar question to the one I asked uh, the previous presentation. Can you describe how you're going to engage with the communities? So you find the community through data analysis, but uh, this is action research, really, and therefore, how are you actually going to physically engage with communities and ensure that the project doesn't actually cause disunity? Because there are examples where attempts to study cohesion actually leads to greater animosity. Uh, okay, well, when we're looking to select the communities, we have them listed off. We gave you a, a brief sample due to the time constraints. So we're looking to focus on some different things. So we have our indicators we're looking for to drive us towards how we're going to select these communities. We are looking for specific uh, communities that are within what we call a high diversity, where there's lots of different groups together. We're looking for those that are in low diversity. And then we're looking for a ones that would sort of fit outside any of the traditional urban or rural types of, types of groups. Now, the experience that our team has uh, is that being political scientists, social psychologists, is that we have members of our team who have extensive um, interactions with these communities already. Uh, for example, we have two members of our team that are out in the field working with some of the marginalized communities that we identified for you. We recognize and we're very sensitive to the perception that top-down is not well received by many communities, and that's one of the concerns that we've identified. So this is about working with the communities from the bottom up. What is it that they want? What is it that they need? And then identifying and facilitating that exchange and bringing those two together. Hi, uh, Ronan from uh, School of Management. So really here is uh, how do you define a social coherence? So what is the range of scope of that? So politically, socially, or economically, or everything. Another thing is, what are the like clear outputs you want out of this project, and uh, how are you going to measure the outcome of that? Yeah, mm -hmm. Thanks. So you, that was a definition of social cohesion. So I think we've we've talked about uh, using some of the key terms that are used in the in the wider literature. That social cohesion relates to the trust we have in one another, our sense of belonging in the community. Uh, our willingness to help one another, uh, and our willingness to participate in activities within, within those communities. Uh, and I think increasingly people also want to see that happening across different ethnic and different kinds of groups within the community. So it also has this idea uh, that people are forming connections outside of their own ethnic and religious or class type groups. So that's the definition that we're using at the moment. There is, uh, um, there is debate about the definition and the measurement, and hopefully through this program, we'll be able to bring clarity to the concept and how it's measured. And then I think the uh, second question related to the output. So what, well really it is what we're excited about. So we're excited about having outputs where we will be able to quickly and easily assess the capabilities and vulnerabilities of communities around Australia using the techniques that we've outlined. We uh, are excited about finding new transferable solutions to building social cohesion. So we want to identify the key factors that are important that communities could harness to strengthen social cohesion. Uh, and 
Uh, there are some other sort of elements of the program we haven't been able to go through, but the multiculturalism policy in Australia will turn 50 during the life of this grand challenge. And we think there's quite a lot of work to be done uh, using historical, archival uh, type work around multiculturalism policy, working with uh, government uh, to really assess uh, what has been effective, where have the challenges been, what might, how might we revitalise that policy going forward and to be part of that conversation for what uh, government's action in the space of social cohesion should be going forward. Hi, my name is Tuofu from uh, uh, the, 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 the College of Business and Economics and uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, the question is, um, uh, in your research, uh, are you going to consider include a case study? Uh, for example, to um, ask people uh, to share their experience uh, that they find it hard to uh, in integrate into the local community. Thanks. Okay. All right. So I think that there are so many questions related to the communities, how we are going to select the communities, um, how, do you, how, how we are going to implement our program in the communities, and what is the outcome going to be. So I, I think I'll explain. So. When we are selecting communities, we are selecting communities based on the level of diversity this community has. We agree that Australia is heterogeneous, right? So we have, uh, we have identified based on ABS at this moment, we have ABS indicators. Based on ABS indicators, we have identified urban areas, which is very heterogeneous. Um, and in those areas, we, we believe that RCT is not possible because we cannot isolate our impact. We also, there are also leakages issues between treatment and control group. So in these, uh, in these areas, which are highly diverse, we are super diverse, in these areas we are going to implement longitudinal case studies and ethnography so that we can, we can come up uh, with recommendation how and what policies work. So in these area, in urban areas, we are going to focus on social enterprises, for example. And in, in here, through longitudinal case study, we are really going to identify mechanism, inclusive business practices that create social cohesion in the communities. So this longitudinal case study will help us to identify inclusive business practices and other kind of new emerging mechanism because case studies are really good in doing that. So we so, believe that it would yeah. be useful. So okay. it's multi-method, I think, mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. uh, a key point, and that's related to it being multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Final question. Um, thank you. I'm Lu Xinxie from Computer Science. I have a question about most working Australians spend about less than one third of their life in residential communities. How would your finding a method and approach work in other communities such as social groups that are um, that gather on a casual basis or workplaces? Would something you do potentially benefit, say, improving social cohesion at the ANU as a community? <laughs> <laughs> well, well I think that's a very good question, and this whole grand challenge has done that. I mean, it has brought communities, discipline from different groups already together, so we already see social cohesion there. But, but having said that, because we don't really have clear indicator to measure social cohesion at this moment, this project will help us to really clarify through a very robust research design how to measure social cohesion, what are the antecedents of social cohesion, what are the barriers, and what are the outcome. So we will have to wait for a few few more years, but in, in terms of benefiting the community, ANU, we can certainly see, but in terms of benefiting the other communities, we believe that social cohesion is the most important ingredient. We have talked about economic sustainability. We know about financial sustainability and environmental sustainability, but we also believe that to, to, to achieve these two core sustainability, we need social sustainability, which will be provided by social cohesion. So thank you for that mm -hmm. question. So thank you. On thank that you. note, please join me in thanking the And for our final uh, presentation today, please um, I invite to the stage to tell us about zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. Thank you, Margaret. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emma Aisbeth and I'm the transdisciplinary research leader for our team. We are super excited to pitch our grand challenge to you tonight, zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. 
But first, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in northwestern Australia, and you'll see why shortly. Presenting with me tonight are Professor Kylie Catchpole, a world-leading solar cell researcher, and Dr Paul Burke, a successful young economist specialising in energy policy in the Asia-Pacific. Professor Catchpole will introduce our research themes to you, but first, Dr Burke will tell you why zero carbon energy for the Asia-Pacific is the grand challenge of the moment. Climate change is the world's greatest challenge. We stand at a decision point. This graph shows alternative emissions pathways from now until the end of the century. If the world acts rapidly to decarbonise our economies, we still have a chance of restricting global warming to two degrees Celsius. If we do not, we are on track for three or four degrees Celsius warming this century, and then more next century. There is an imperative to get moving on decarbonisation and to do so in a way that creates exciting opportunities for our economy and our communities. The time to act is now. We are in the Asian century. Over the next two decades, two-thirds of energy use growth will be here in the Asia Pacific, in China, India, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere. If this energy is high carbon, we are on track for dangerous climate change. This setting provides Australia with a tremendous opportunity. If we could boost our energy exports while switching to a zero carbon energy export model, we could gain an economic boon while also making a major proactive <coughs> contribution to a, the avoidance of dangerous climate change. Australia is an energy superpower. We are the world's largest exporter of coal. And as of next year, the world's largest exporter of natural gas. Both of these are carbon intensive fuels. Australia is also by far the world's largest exporter of iron ore. And this is our largest energy product. Iron ore is used in very carbon intensive manufacturing processes in the production of steel. Are we serious about climate change? If we are, we need to get moving to switch our energy export bundle to a zero carbon one. Let's create a new economic model for Australia, one based on zero carbon energy. Australia can lead on this issue. Fortunately, Australia's natural endowments place us well to reach this vision. Australia is richly endowed in renewable energy, in the sun and the wind. Our solar endowments are particularly impressive. With just the land area shown by this blue dot, we could generate enough electricity to supply Australia's needs. With the land area shown by the green dot, we could generate enough electricity to supply the whole world's needs. Australia is very well placed to become a new type of energy superpower, a zero carbon energy superpower. Our Grand Challenge team will undertake trans transformational research that will change the way Australia trades with the world. Our research will proceed on four pathways. First of all, we will undertake research on the export of zero carbon electricity from Australia to Asia via subsea cables. This is electricity produced in Australia using renewable energy. Second, we will carry out research on the export of zero carbon hydrogen rich fuels produced in Australia 
using renewable energy. Third, we will carry out research on the export of zero carbon refined metals and products. Finally, we will do the work that will underpin the development of policy and legal frameworks for uptake of zero carbon energy in countries throughout the Asia Pacific. This is our vision for zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. I will now hand on to Professor Kylie Catchpole who will explain how we will do this. Thank you, Paul. We'll focus our research on Northwest Australia. Northwest Australia has a number of important advantages. Firstly, it has a huge amount of solar and wind available. It has the potential for a 100% renewable electricity grid through pumped hydro and battery storage. It has enormous mineral resources and it's close to major Asian markets. Our research will have the potential for immediate impact through companies that are starting to develop projects with zero carbon exports. For example, our industry partner, CWP Renewables, is leading a consortium to develop the Asian Renewable Energy Hub in the Pilbara region. This multi-billion dollar, 11 gigawatt, solar, wind and electricity storage project will eventually be the second largest power station in the world, as well as providing electricity for export to Indonesia and onto Singapore, it will also provide electricity for new domestic industries in Northwest Australia. So, how do we achieve, achieve as vision for zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific? First of all, we need to understand the diverse perspectives of a wide range of stakeholders from traditional owners of country to foreign governments. Based on this understanding, we will develop new ways to share the benefits to achieve a fair and sustainable energy transition. We will develop new technologies for renewable energy systems, for hydrogen generation and for metal refining. And we will develop new policy and legal frameworks in order to achieve the required level of coordination and investment. Benefits that are shared with stakeholders and communities are essential for achieving a fair and sustainable transition. First of all, we have to make sure that we take advantage of the genuine opportunity for sustainable development that renewable energy growth offers to the traditional owners of the land. We'll therefore work with Indigenous people and other local communities to ensure best practice involvement in these new industries. In particular, we're looking at how to structure agreements between renewable energy projects and local indigenous communities that bring maximum benefit for those communities, not just for the near term, but for the intergenerational timescale of the agreement. This work is very new, and there's been almost no research done in this area to date. We'll therefore work with leading indigenous organizations to share the results of this work as widely as possible so we can ensure maximum benefit for local communities. We'll also be researching what determines social license to operate for large-scale renewable energy projects for both indigenous and non-indigenous communities. And of course, communities are not the only stakeholders who will determine the success of our zero carbon ambitions. We'll therefore work with governments, with companies, and with energy utilities to understand their shared interests and work with them to maximise our impact. There are a number of technological and economic challenges to transition to a renewable energy-based economy. For example, <coughs> renewable electricity systems are completely different from traditional electricity systems. There's lots of electricity available when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, and there's potentially deficits at other times. We will research new ways to design and control renewable energy systems that balance the generation, transmission and storage in order to achieve reliable and low cost electricity. We'll also research potentially disruptive technologies for hydrogen generation and metal refining. For example, we'll be looking at new ways to generate hydrogen directly using solar energy, which has the potential to be much cheaper than existing technologies. 
We'll also be looking at new ways to, to refine metals that don't use fossil fuels as input, but instead use electricity and hydrogen. Regulation and governance are essential for achieving the coordination of interests required for a successful energy transition. And there are a few key areas that have the potential for particularly large impact. So we'll be working on policies that can accelerate progress in these areas. For example, it is clear that there will be a lot more trade in electricity in the future to take advantage of the low cost of renewable energy in places where there's large renewable energy resources. This will require new formal legal frameworks for international trade and investment in electricity. Secondly, policy has a huge impact on the uptake of renewables. So we'll be researching what determines policy impact on the uptake of renewables in countries across Asia, taking into account local political and legal frameworks. This work will build on ANU's world-leading expertise in economic tools for carbon reduction. And it will also provide a benchmark for our work on the competitiveness of Australian exports of renewable energy. We'll also be looking at legal frameworks for hydrogen supply chains. And basing, based on our work with Indigenous involvement, we'll be looking at the role of state governments in supporting and empowering these communities to benefit from opportunities. I'll now pass over to Emma to talk about our team. Thank you, Kylie. So a fair and sustainable transformation of Australia's energy relationship with the region truly is a grand challenge. But why should it be the ANU that leads this transformation? In short, because the ANU has a breadth of world-class energy researchers working across disciplines and topics, from governance and community to technology. ANU has the depth of expertise in the Asia-Pacific. And ANU has accomplished interdisciplinary researchers capable of making the linkages required to ensure that research is transformative. Last but not least, the ANU has the ANU Energy Change Institute, directed by Professor Ken Baldwin, which has the capacity to bring all of these people together in a strong and cohesive team. In addition to cohesion, Gender and career stage diversity are important goals for our team. Our recruitment to date has already improved the gender balance among energy researchers at the ANU. We work hard to ensure that our project offers productive opportunities, leadership experience and mentoring for early and mid-career researchers of all genders. Our project is about sustainable investments, including in human capital. Our team also extends beyond the ANU. The Energy Change Institute already has an impressive track record of engagement, including successful collaborations with government and industry. Our energy change, our <laughs> zero carbon Asia Pacific research is deepening these relationships. Important players like CWP Renewables and Evo Energy have already contributed expertise and funds to our research. Representatives from these companies sit along representatives, alongside representatives from several government agencies and award-winning ANU academics on our active and engaged steering committee. Importantly, our Zero Carbon Asia Pacific research is also expanding our collaborations, especially with community and indigenous organisations. All of these relationships are important. They help to ensure that our research is relevant, up-to-date, impactful. To sum up, a timely, fair and sustainable transition to zero carbon energy in the Asia Pacific is an economic and moral imperative. We will research four pathways through which Australia could dramatically contribute to such a transformation. For each of these, our researchers will combine their expertise across a broad range of academic disciplines to produce truly groundbreaking research. By working closely with our external collaborators, we will ensure that our research has impact and delivers on the promise of zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific. Thank you. Um, so thank you. I'm sure there are questions from the floor.
Hello, I'm Hang from um, management. Uh, thank you very much for the beautiful uh, presentation. I want to ask how do you commercialize and compete with the big mining industry in Australia? Oh, excellent, thank you. I, I almost paid her to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the reasons that I was really excited to be, get part of this um, project is because we all know that in Australia there's a serious political economy issue regarding the coal industry. And um, I studied political economy, and the more I've studied it, the more I've realised that the best way to combat a serious industry lobby group is to help grow an opposing lobby group. And so I'm very excited <laughs> to be helping the renewables energy um, industry grow. I'd just like to add to that in terms of mining, looking at the, uh, the metals um, mining industry, they would love to have this energy. They actually want it because it's going to be cheaper for them. So they're very, very keen on bringing that into their system. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, hi, Colin Klein, School of Philosophy. Uh, on the Asia Pacific end, so there was a lot about stakeholders in Australia, but I was wondering about stakeholders in, for example, India or China, which had the really big circles on the graph. You want to start? Yeah, so a key focus of our, of our work is to look at the policy and legal environment in Asia-Pacific countries, including key ones Indonesia, India and China, and to develop mechanisms that will help uh, a transition away from coal, mostly coal, towards zero carbon energy. There are some big challenges in countries like Indonesia, for example, with subsidies for coal and for electricity consumption. And there are some key reforms that we think we can help uh, that would help to improve progress towards this goal of zero carbon energy. I could add a little on China. So, I mean, the Chinese are actually very progressive and doing a lot on this themselves, right? So, I mean, we're really focusing on what can we do as Australia? Where can we have the maximum impact? Um, and, of course, one thing we may be doing is contributing a part to the a trans-Asian grid, essentially, that will help support the growth of renewables by helping to balance out um, energy where it's available, when it's available. Hi, I'm Rachel Columby from uh, ANU. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. I just wanted to ask what the time frame was for the project because it's, it's massive. So I just wanted to get a sense of the, the length of the, the project. Should, should I? I mean, so that's an excellent question. And um, different parts of the project will have different sort of time frames to completion. But what we're looking at is what can we do in a five year time frame? And so for the technology for it, technologies, for example, they're not going to be operating at scale and our entire iron ore is not going to be refined in Australia with renewable energy in five years. But in five years, we could have made substantial progress on developing the technologies required to do that at an economically efficient manner. On the other hand, you know, the Asian Renewable um, Energy Hub is being developed by our industry partners. And so that really could be and will be delivering money in uh, money, money to them, electricity to other people, um, and hopefully, which is really important to us, benefits to Indigenous partners. And so the sorts of outputs that we're looking at in the five-year time frame um, include things like guidelines for um, Indigenous communities negotiating with renewables investors, because this is not the only renewable investment coming to Indigenous controlled land. Um, you have some fairly uh, adventurous technology, which is highly contested worldwide. So, you know, some holy grail of creating high, you know, direct uh, solar or whatever electricity to hydrogen uh, that's highly efficient, uh, creating direct uh, metallurgical refinery, again, without any um, uh, CO2 emission. Uh, what, why should we think that we have the ability to be uh, out in front of the rest of the world on those technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sure. So for uh, direct generation of hydrogen, uh, both the US Department of Energy and a recent um, Australian roadmap have said that direct generation of hydrogen has the potential to be much cheaper than existing technologies. Uh, so we've demonstrated a solar to hydrogen efficiency of 16%, which is the highest that's been demonstrated with a potentially low cost process. So we think we have the potential to move that forward uh, and to look not only at that technology, but around those technologies to look at um, how we can move it forward with a, with a low cost process. On the metal refining, 
this is very hard. And there's actually been not much work done in this area uh, at all. So far, most people have been focusing on using biocoke as, as a replacement in um, iron ore refining. This seems to us to be a dead end um, because it's going to require a lot of biomass and it's going to have a large environmental impact. So we're looking at uh, technologies of pyrolysis and electrolysis, so using electricity or hydrogen in those processes. So there's certainly significant challenges, but we do have a lot of expertise at ANU on high temperature uh, processing with, with chemicals, uh, including reduction of uh, iron oxide and manganese oxide. So we think um, we've got a lot of scope to do something in this area. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask, given the time frame of the project, looking towards what we're looking at in climate destabilisation and the regions in the tropics where you are looking at basing this project, what's your strategy for dealing with resilience of an increased uh, affect major climatic events, both in your production electricity transmission and delivery to some of those communities which are likely to be highly impacted within the next 20 or 30 years? And how do you avoid having a situation where those communities become dependent on a arguably tenuous link back to mainland Australia and, you, and how you will protect that technology or develop it to be future-proof? Um, so, so I'm not an engineer anymore, but I do know that we have very good engineers um, both at ANU and in our industry partners who ha have obviously thought about, you know, you have to plan in that a huge tropical storm is going to come through on a, you know, every X number of years so that already the wind turbines are designed to, to withstand cyclones. Um, the obvious and very good question is, what happens if such a tropical storm takes out the, un the subsea cable? Um, and the answer to that is that ultimately you will need to have uh, probably pumped hydro storage in a relatively significant amount on the Indonesian side of that cable. And that's one of the working, Paul and myself and um, people working on communities and we have also specialists with, um, on the sort of anthropology of Indonesia is how do you site those pumped hydro sites without sort of dispossessing marginalised people in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, okay, please join with me in thanking the final team for the presentation.